speaking. Right, afterlife, some thoughts. I'm so sorry that due to illness, what at home we're calling a time of shingle bells, that I'm unable to take part in this symposium. I would like to thank Perona for asking me to write some words, which she has generously offered to read. When Perona sent me the abstract and title for my proposed talk, History, so where did the recklessness, not, where did the recklessness lie? Perona mentions a review by um, critic Irene McManus of the Frink exhibition at Yorkshire Sculpture Park in 1983, in which McManus states that Frink was notorious for losing track of her works. In fact, she was scrupulous about record keeping when it was in her control. During her lifetime, Frink recorded each of her sculptures in annual stock books. These are held within the archive and list the following information. Material, dates, dimensions, edition numbers, original purchaser or commissioner, and whether the edition was completed, etc. The stock books, along with the extensive photographic archive, enable us to provenance any particular sculpture. And there are quite a few fakes out there. We've all been listening, hearing about fakes in the news recently. And what happens to Frank's sculptures once they're sold on? Then the role of the dealer or auction house becomes significant, and they do vary. Some are scrupulous, some are less so, and some seem totally ignorant of provenance. Of course, any artist, including Frink, could try to keep track of every artwork they make, but generally they're fully engaged in working on new pieces. And if, like Frink, they work with no assistance, then it is difficult to see how they could begin to undertake such a task. Since the 1980s, the Design and Artists Copyright Society, DAX, have been working with artists and artist estates on issues relating to royalties and copyright, transforming the process of provenance. If we move away from the artist and into the public and commercial realm, is there another form of recklessness? As a curator, I believe that my profession has a duty of care, not only to the material culture associated and invested within each artwork or artifact, but also to the artists, makers, and the society in which they were created. I don't feel that fashion and agendas should become deciding factors in terms of artistic judgments, even if they are the arbiters of taste. The lifetime of an artist is relatively short, and that of a cultural movement generally much shorter. What is needed is distance, and that, of course, presents many problems regarding decision-making. Not everything that is created by every artist can be kept. There is simply not enough space, nor sufficient resources. There are certain artists and artworks that have a particular resonance that transcends time and cultures. And I believe that Elizabeth Frank falls into this category in several areas. These include the humanist themes that she explored and which maintain their relevance across generations. The rigorous manner in which she developed a range of sculptural techniques using plaster and casting methods. The expressive qualities of her drawings, which she also applied to various original printmaking techniques. The ongoing significance of many of her public and sacred commissions to a large number of communities and individuals. When Frank died in 1993, she left a vast amount of material relating to her lifetime of work as an artist, plasters and bronzes, drawings and original prints, studio materials, photographs and other ephemera. Her personal art collection and the contents of much of her final home at Woolland in Blanford, Dorset. Lan Jamais, her son, took on the responsibility of all this, and I have had the pleasure to work with him since 1995. The legacy of material became the basis um, for the Frink Estate and Archive. It is a huge repository which relates not just to with the Dorset History Centre, 
formerly the County Record Office, as part of the National Archive Initiative, Archiving the Arts. However, the estate and the archive remained the personal property of Lang. In August last year, Lang died. Consequently, the Frink estate and archive will move into another phase, much of it being gifted to public collections. I have remarked upon the task of working towards probate. I have embarked upon the task of working towards probate. Lance's sons, Tully and Bree, as well as my husband, Ian, are assisting me with the physical challenges of gathering, collating, and checking the many thousands of items. The executors and I will then embark upon the distribution of the estate and archive to fulfill Lance's final wishes. In the meantime, we continue to support exhibitions and current research related to Elizabeth Frink. We are delighted that her work is on show in Cambridge, particularly since she grew up in East Anglia and had strong associations with the area. We are also pleased to be working with the Sainsbury Centre for the Visual Arts in Norwich on their forthcoming exhibition. This will include many pieces from the estate and archive. However, it is important not just to see Frink through English eyes. For me, her work continues to be stimulating and exciting, and its relevance extends far beyond the shores of these islands. It is always disappointing when her work is seen as embedded within the ideas and approaches of post-Second World War British art movements. It is far more rewarding, but possibly more challenging, to look at how her thinking and working practices evolved and matured. I see Elizabeth Frink as a truly contemporary artist and one whose work has huge relevance to our troubled world. I'm interested in the manner in which she began to explore the actions um, and nature of humans within the context of other animal species. Her sculptural images inspired by animal forms are frequently relegated to the realm of animal art. This entirely misses the point. What Frink questions is our sense of superiority as humans. She despairs at our species with its ill-considered actions and attitudes that threaten the entire planet. This context frees Frink from the narrow confines of 20th century British art and allows her work and ideas to be considered within other cultures and contexts. In recent years, we have been working with a German gallery and museum whose curators have embraced Frink's work and its significance within a much wider framework. They are working towards a major exhibition with, with plans developing for it to tour to Holland and France. We hope that the current and planned exhibitions, as well as the gift of material from the Frink Estate and Archive, will provide an impetus for a long overdue and wider reappraisal of her work by leading galleries in Britain and abroad. Thank you all for listening. Annette, thank you.